We have uh, Bruce Deng and uh, Peter Ferry in spirit, um, who will uh, tell us about uh, Microsoft's efforts uh, at uh, analysing Stuxnet. Take it away, Bruce. Big hand, please. Yeah, so before I start, um, I don't want to say anything about the Mossad. Uh, but yeah, we, we had the running joke. Uh, so like a few days, I heard some like, Iranian scientists got killed in a drive-by. Uh, Peter would talk to me, and then like, he's like, oh, man, I got to go. Uh, somebody said, oh, he, dis he got disconnected from the network. Then he disappeared for a week, and I, I didn't know what happened. And then uh, he came back, like, oh, yeah, Bruce, I was walking on the sidewalk. I got hit by a car. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. So, anyways, um, so yeah, so, but uh, Peter, so a lot of this, so uh, all this stuff, all this content here, the mistakes are mine, not Peter. So, if there's something wrong, blame me, not Peter. Uh, so, anyways, I'll start. So, uh, one of the reasons for this talk is uh, we actually planned this talk, uh, I planned it with Felix a few months ago. Uh, and at the time, we were, there weren't that many publications about Stuxnet, of all the different volumes and so on. Task scheduler uh, didn't get fixed yet, uh, so we were planning to like uh, this would be like the first time where we talk about this. So this is the reason. Uh, and the other one is uh, we actually analyzed our team analyzed this uh, Stuxnet malware like within the first few weeks when it came in, but we weren't allowed to talk about it for very obvious reasons until now. I think this is like the first time where I'm allowed to talk about this kind of stuff. So. Um, and the other uh, reason why is uh, we want to share instead of sharing you know all of this data blah 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 stuff. I'm going to talk about how we actually analyzed it, like the, the process that we went through, you know, how we, uh, how we f identified the vulnerabilities, how they were fixed, and the different people involved, and so on. So it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, so anyways, with that, I'll continue on. So I'm going to start, I'm going to talk about the, how we, uh, so there are two important, you guys know what Stuxnet is, right? So I don't have to sit here and explain. Uh, so there are two, uh, to me, there are two aspects of Stuxnet that were um, interesting. One uh, was the, the fact that it used four zero-day vulnerabilities, and the second part was the SCADA uh, component. Uh, I am not a SCADA expert. I don't actually don't know anything about SCADA, so I'm not going to talk about that here. Peter did some stuff on it, but he's not here. So, uh, And then if we have some time at the end, I'm going to talk about how uh, we decompiled uh, uh, some components of Stuxnet. Um, Rolf Rolls and I actually decompiled two components back to compi like, compilable C code, and like, we're pretty confident it's... Uh, like nearly identical to the original source code because when we compile it, the opcodes match up like, I don't know, like 80 something percent. So, uh, well, uh, but if we, yeah, that's only if we have enough time. And then at the end, I'll talk about the lessons learned, like what went wrong and what, how I could have learned this, uh, how I could have analyzed this faster. All right, so the prologue, to set the background for this, um, I don't remember what day this was, but it's somewhere in July. This uh, one day, this company, uh, this is an a, uh, called Virus Block uh, ADA. Uh, they're a small AV vendor in Belarus. Uh, I actually never heard of them. They sent us, uh, they found the malware and they sent us a PDF doing some initial triage. And the, the PDF talked about, uh, they show a screenshot which was then, uh, had some redacted, you know, like there's a screenshot and there's like black spots there. And they're talking about the potential Windows Zero Day using LNK files. Uh, and then um, later, we didn't get the sample and then some guy from the AV test company sent them to us. And then at the, the time, there were also dis discussions on various internal mailing lists. Uh, people talking, oh, is this some new Windows Zero Day? People were not quite sure yet. So, and then uh, after we got the sample, the uh, case manager actually uh, opened a case and they came to our office and asked, hey, you know, people are talking about this. It uh, seems like it's a pretty big deal. Can, we, uh, can you guys take a look at it? And at first, you know, the way he described the vulnerability, it says, oh, you know, auto run through link files, blah, 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 blah. So at the time we thought, okay, well, just another auto run vault. Like, why do we need to take a look at this, right? Um, and uh, but at the end we, uh, we we said, okay, fine, we'll take a look at it, and it's a good thing that we did. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how <clears throat> I'm gonna go. So there are four vaults. I'm gonna talk about how we find each one of them and the techniques we use to find them. Okay. So the first thing, some more background. So you gotta remember that when this came in. Uh, there's a lot of pr there were a lot of press uh, uh, talks, I guess, about this. People they didn't know that there were volunteers there, but there were like a lot of pr press attention. Uh, there we knew that there were other companies looking at this. We knew Symantec, McAfee, and pretty much all the AV vendors, all the other security companies were looking at this. Um, and uh, we it was important for, for our team that we need to know all the different. Uh, let me take this back a bit further. 
At the time, we did not know that there were four volumes in there. We knew there was only one volume, which is the LNK one. We didn't know there were, a, there were three more. Um, but we knew that other people were looking at it. And so it was important for us to know, you know the details of the volumes, if any, before the other companies. Knowing first is pretty important to us because uh, then we can tell our customers about them. Uh, we don't get money by publishing our results, so unlike other companies. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. And uh, another thing you got to keep in mind is Stuxnet is about a meg of code, like in binary form. So that's actually, you know, it's not, you know, some people might think, oh, a meg is nothing. Well, actually analyzing one meg of binary code is a bit, uh, not knowing what you're looking for. So, um, and we have had a very short amount of time to do this, because people were always, uh, management were always constantly coming by asking us, okay, well, you know, are there updates to this? Because the press requests, blah, 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 blah. So, and another thing is, uh, when we're investigating this, there were a lot of, uh, like, expertise required, because the, these volumes happen in different components in Shell and Win3K.sys, and it, although, you know, we have really smart people on our team, no one knows everything, so we need help from other people. So it's like a team effort, pretty much. These are the facts, you got to keep these facts in mind. Like, timing is really, really important. And also, you don't know what you're looking for. I mean, it's like all black box, right? All right, so the, the trick that we, uh, we came up with was we divided, when this miner came in, we divided the task into two, uh, two, uh, two people. One was Peter Ferry, and one was uh, the other person's me. And the way we did it, uh, the, we were assigned to, uh, basically told us, okay, stop, work, stop working on whatever you're working on, like spend full time on this. And the objective was that not to understand everything from the beginning to the end, but basically to identify suspicious um, blocks of code that may be related to vulnerabilities, and then isolate them and like, try to understand them as soon as possible, and then pass that knowledge to the developer so that you know, like, they can figure stuff out. Um, and like, understanding every minute details is not important to us, because that's like, almost like a, not a waste of time, but it's, it wasn't important to our team at the time. Uh, and then the other uh, thing is that, uh, so the developers, developers, most of them, you know, they don't read assembly code every single day, right? But they do know how the components they own, they do know how it works and so on. So we need to take, you know, transfer our reverse engineering knowledge to them. They can use that to, like, you know, try to figure out what the vuln is and vice versa. So, all right. So bug number one, this is, uh, so this is what we got. This is actually an unredacted uh, version. Uh, so this is the file that we got from uh, the sample. This, this is a link file. If you notice, there is uh, like a path, it's like a .tmp blah 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 path. So, this, so the first thing we, we saw, we looked at this file, we was like, okay, well, the link, link file is, is a binary file format. This is like when you right click and create a shortcut, uh, you create a link file. Uh, so the first thing we did was, we converted the link, in order to figure out what the vuln is, for this, we knew that like, you know, the path, you know, somehow, uh, the path to the file is somehow, you know, not valid properly, but we didn't know where that was happening. So the first thing we did was we dumped the contents of the LNK file into human parsable form. So, you know, all the different fields and so on. And then so we dumped it, and then here at the end, uh, the path name is the CP1 name. It's actually like a structure, uh, a field inside a, a structure in the LNK file. So this is a path. Uh, normally, you, you would see C dollar, uh, sorry, C colon, WAP, blah, dot, you know, C, WAP, sorry, C colon, WAP, Windows, System32, blah. But here they use a different, uh, uh, a different format. But this path is basically, uh, you can use this path as well. This path is uh, used for uh, removable devices. For this one is for specific to a Kingston USB device. So the original uh, sample came from, a, like a, I guess, a USB, uh, Kingston USB stick. Um, so we knew from the behavior, of the, the, like from the description that people were, de were describing, we knew that the DLL that's, that's specified, you know, like this file here is a DLL. We knew that was somehow being loaded into the, uh, the export.exe. Uh, but we didn't actually quite know, you know all the details at that point. So what, it, what we did was we just, set, uh, we just tell the debugger, hey, notify me when this DLL is loaded. And then, so the, the, then, then when the DLL is loaded, the, current, the debugger breaks in, and we, get a, we got a stack trace. And then from the stack trace, we figured out, okay, well, blah, it's like, pretty simple. We know where the vuln is. And this took, like, I don't know, like two or three minutes. Um, remember, like, so when we, had this, when we opened this case, there were, I don't know, probably like 20, 30 people involved, and emails were being exchanged back and forth, literally like every two or three minutes probably. Uh, like, and then, so the root cause is basically uh, LNK files contain uh, li uh, uh, links uh, to a, a target, right? Uh, show needs to know the icon to represent this uh, shortcut. And control panel links, which is a special type of link file, has the property called dynamic icons. And in order for the shell to get the icons, what they do is they literally call load library on this. And when you, you know, anybody who programs Windows, load library, when you pass it, uh, it will execute DLL main automatically. So the, the end result is that 
uh, you get code running like in the current user uh, context like automatically. Um, so the code path, this is uh, that's actually so this is the top the top this is actually a stack trace. The top function here is that's actually where a call to low library, and the bottom is all the functions that led to it. And, the re and I'm not showing the source code. I'm actually not going to show any. I'm not going to show any source code for any of these volumes because these volumes are so simple to understand that like having source code is just, just like it doesn't even matter. So anyway, so literally here with this volume, you get to load library any file you want. Okay, any uh, then the file can be located anywhere. Uh, the attack vectors. Okay, so once we figure out the volume, that, okay, well, uh, looks like uh, the shell doesn't validate uh, where the DL is being loaded from to get the icons. So, okay, but that was like, you know, we, the one we made a repro with C dollar, you know, C, do, C colon windows, I mean, C colon temp blah dot DLL. But we were wondering, okay, well, usually uh, web dev, what, about, like, what if you put it, the, the DLL in a UNC share on the internet or something like that? Would this work? And that was important to us because and that basically means that you can exploit this, uh, you can put your file on the internet and, you know, you can destroy the world. Uh, so we, uh, it turns out that uh, we were able to create uh, a repro that, um, uses WebDAV, where the deal is not stored on the local drive, it's stored somewhere on the internet. And when we found this out, it's like, wow, dude, it's like, like really bad stuff. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, and when, and then, so, of course, at the time, once we figure out, okay, all the different attack vectors, we know, okay, this is really bad, we need to, uh, like, act very fast. And, of course, at the same time, there are, like, you know, management asking, okay, what are we going to do, blah, 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 blah. Of course, like, when, once, we figure out the, once we figure out the root cause, like, literally about a minute or two after that, the fix was, rec there was somebody recommended a fix. So the initial uh, proposal for the fix is, okay, well, uh, force it so that the, 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 the DLLs will can only be loaded from C Windows System 32, which requires you know, admin to write to it first, right? Uh, it seems kind of obvious. Uh, but then the shell developer said, no, that uh, actually we shouldn't do that because that goes against our public guidance to people. Uh, we tell people, hey, you know, don't put your control panel files in, uh, like in the C -S -S Windows System uh, 32 directory, put it somewhere else. So uh, if we were to, you know, put it, we, we, we had the first fix, then that would break a lot of third-party developer stuff, and that's like bad news, and we don't want to do that. So the final fix is actually um, different. We, ch we, we make sure that the applet, the control panel applet, is registered before we load the dynamic icons. So, uh, and lo so yeah, so that's how we, we fix that one. Um, and of course, again, this happens literally within minutes after we figure out the root cause. Um, and I think the fix was implemented pretty, uh, this one we went out of band. So it was, yeah, so the, they built uh, the final binary like, pretty quickly. So uh, from the attacker perspective, like what the hell is this used for? Because all you can, with this volume, all you can do is you can only get, um, you can get code running, but code running only in the current user contact. So you're not gonna be able to lower a driver or anything else. Um, so it seems kind of useless, but it's actually not true uh, because uh, what is this used for? This is used for to gain an initial, um, I guess like a uh, footstep on the computer you need, that you need on, your, on the target computer. Um, and again, uh, you, you gotta, one thing you gotta remember is like, this is 100% reliable. There's no quote unquote you know, like memory corruption here. So it, it will be successful 100% of the time. Uh, and anyways, uh, so this moment, uh, after we, we you know, released a fix and stuff like that, uh, we did some further investigation. It turns out this moment was known for s several years by various people. Um, but of course, nobody told me about that. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So and then so this is the one that we uh, we actually went out of band. This is within like two weeks, I think, went out of band. And the reason why we went out of band is because once our team figured out the implications of this bug and how horrible it is, it's like holy crap, man! Like we need to go like immediately. Uh, but of course, out of band is very expensive, and you need to calculate. You know, there are many factors that add in. It's it's extremely expensive. I don't know what the figure is, but it's like you know, like way more than my salary. Um, and so we had to think about it pretty, you know, like carefully. Uh, and we also look at uh, some of the telemetry data, uh, you know, how we had, you know, some signatures being deployed for this particular vulnerability. And we found that there are a lot of people being affected by this. So at the end, we decided to, like, to go out of band. And of course, you know, Metasploit added, uh, had an export for this. So, like, you know, like seven-year-olds can exploit people. So it's pretty simple. So it's bad news. So yeah, that's how we went, that's why we went out of band. The interesting fact is, for this one, there was no reverse engineering required, right? Because we just had the LNK file and we knew what was going on. So there's like everything I just explained to you here happened within about one hour after we released a sample, you know, setting up emails and adding the right people and so on. 
All right, so the next thing was bug number two. So once we found the LNK file, that was like pretty easy. It didn't require any, like, didn't require that much brain power. So the next one was, uh, the, the, uh, of course, I didn't know that, we fixed LNK, we looked at LNK, we knew it was a bug, we didn't know there were more. So how did we find about the second one? So what happened was, I was trying to do some, I was doing some analysis on this bug. And I ran out, of course, like most normal people, I analyzed malware on Windows XP. Uh, and I noticed that on Windows XP, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm being serious, like, no, most malware analysts use Windows XP, right? Yes, exactly. Even, I mean, even the VM to people emulate, it's all Windows XP. Uh, so anyways, uh, so I noticed I ran as normal user, and I noticed, crap, dude, they're like rootkits being uh, deployed. It's like, what the hell is going on? And then I, t I told another friend of mine who is uh, working, he works in the Windows team, and he ran, he, and he's a Windows developer, so he works on Windows 7. So he ran this on his computer, and he's like, holy crap, man, that happened to me too. What the fuck? <laughs> uh, so at, at this point, you got to remember, this is, like in the, this is in the afternoon. Right? This is in the afternoon, it's like late in the afternoon, I'm trying like four, like 5, 6 p.m. or something like that. So I'm like, holy shit, man, this is like not good. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but the thing is like, we knew, we knew that uh, the rootkits were being deployed, but we didn't know how the, how the rootkits were like dropped, right? Because you need to install the rootkit somehow, we didn't know how that was done. And I, I, I clearly remember, like, at the time, I was exchanging an email with a buddy of mine, uh, was, uh, Frank Baldwin, I don't know if he's here or not, but I, I, we, we were exchanging some emails about this, and I asked him, hey, dude, uh, like, well, I'm looking at this crap, and like, do you know like, the, how the, like, the uh, root kits were deployed, right? And of course, uh, you know, he lives in Germany, and we're living in the U.S., so our time zone difference you know, like, is bad. So we didn't get a response. So the following day, of course, we investigated. Um, so we, so, the, so we went investigating. The way we did it was, uh, we did, we divide, again, we divided the task. I did, it, I did my own thing, and Arthur did his own thing. Uh, so what Arthur did was, he debugged this live. He, he, like, he looked at a window bug uh, to explore that exe and start tracing it. But as you know, like I said, there's like a mag of code. So you, unless you know what the hell you're doing, you're going to waste a lot of time, right? So of course, that's what Arthur did. He spent a lot of time looking at this assembly, and he didn't find shit. So uh, he didn't make much progress. So he, he was like, really stressed out about this. Because again, again, when we told management, hey, dude, uh, looks like uh, we have like uh, low, uh, esc uh, escalation privilege on XPN Win 7. What the hell do we do? They, of course, are freaked out, right? So they want results fast. So uh, Arthur, the following morning, what he did was he used a different approach. Instead of doing you know, deep live dynamic analysis, he, did, he used a process monitor, and he, uh, he looked at event logs. Uh, being myself, I said, oh, man, this is a like, waste of your time. Fucking process monitor is like, you know, not useful for this. Nobody uses this for reverse engineering. I was wrong. Uh, so, when, yeah, so he looked at the process monitor logs, and eventually he found two interesting facts. He found that um, there were scheduled tasks being added, and he also saw that there were uh, files being written, uh, uh, there, there was an XML file being read from the disk and then rewritten back to the disk. And so what he, he didn't know where, like, so because process monitor like, they only tells you what's happened. They don't tell you exactly where in the binary that happens. So basically what we did was when, uh, we had an internal tool and we were able to figure out, okay, exactly. We set a breakpoint on like create file and we knew exactly where, uh, where, where in the binary that file was being created and so on. So once we knew that, once we suspected that uh, uh, this had something to do with, ta with scheduled tasks, we added the developers of the uh, you know, task scheduler to the, to the list. And of course these people are like mad smart, right? After a few minutes, we told them, you know, here, here are the behaviors that we're observing. Uh, we extract the file uh, before, like the XML file before and after, and we told them, here, this is what's going on, here's what we're seeing. Of course, they immediately said, oh, yeah, dude, this probably has to do something with our CRC checksums. <laughs> and, uh, of course, you know, at the time I'm reading this, I'm like, no, dude, it's, this can't be. Uh, so it turns out that uh, this is the case. The so the way it works is, uh, I'll explain next, but yeah, they use a hash algorithm, and the hash algorithm was CRC32. Uh, so, and then, like, of course, I didn't believe him and stuff, so what I, I looked at the, the Stuxnet binary, and I was like, yep, yeah, you're right. Uh, so the way here's how, here's how it works. Um, on Windows Vista and higher, uh, when you add a, create a scheduled task, uh, it actually stores all the information about the task in an, X, in, X, in an XML file. And the XML file contains, uh, like, which user it, uh, the task is supposed to be executed as. So usually it's by you, right? Uh, and uh, the task, task scheduler will check some this XML file, save the checksum in a registry somewhere, and then before it executes, it checks, it hashes the file again, it checks to see if that is the same or not. Because when you create a task, you actually have readable, it's actually readable and writable. So anyway, so that's how they did it. Uh, if the checksums don't match, and you know, obviously there's some corruption, so we don't execute. But if the same, execute. But of course here, you know, CRC 32 collision is very easy. It takes like, you know, like five seconds to, to generate one. And that's what the Stuxnet author did. Um, 
So the attack plan, here's how it works. They, well, they create a task, uh, which is basically one DLL, blah, blah, that's how it loads a driver. And then it checksums the file just before, uh, um, the, just before the file gets closed, and it saves a hash. Then it opens up the file again, and it keeps on padding the file until uh, this checksum is the same. And that's boom, that's it. And then they disable the task and run the task again to, stop the, to uh, bypass the caching stuff. And that's pretty much it. And uh, what they did was they changed the current user to local system. So local system is like the highest privilege you, you get, I guess. So they get code running as uh, root. Easy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's, I mean, this is what, the reason why, I, again, this one, I didn't have to show you any source code because it'd be worthless. Right? I mean, I just to be like, you know, get CRC checksum. I think that's all the function is called. So anyways, uh, so once we found this out, they were like, oh, okay, again, this is within minutes after we figured this out and confirmed it, uh, okay, some guy proposed to change it. What the fuck? What do we do? Uh, so we said, okay, well, let's, let's do, uh, let's change the naive, uh, so we, let's change, uh, change the checksum. It's like, okay, instead of using CRC, let's use, uh, like, you know, a stronger crypt, uh, hash algorithm. Uh, so and then the next option, which came from another person, he said, okay, well, how about we change the permission of the task file? Don't only allow read access after the, after the fact. Don't allow write access. So that, you know, that, I mean, they can't modify the file. Uh, and then the third option was, okay, we'll store the task somewhere else. Don't put it in an XML file on disk. So we'll put it somewhere else, only system can read it. Uh, and in the end, you know, there are different advantage, disadvantages and disadvantages for each of these solutions. Like, uh, primarily, a lot of these things are app, uh, backwards app compat issues. Uh, and in the end, uh, option one uh, won. And so we changed the hash algorithm to SHA-256. And this update was released, I guess, last week. So that's it. So if you diff the fix, you'll see these new calls to like, use SHA-256. Um, so from the attacker perspective, so what the hell is this used for? Uh, so the LNK was used to get an initial like, foothold on the, on the station, and it checks to see what operating system you're running. And if you're running Windows Vista or higher, it will, use, it will add a, a scheduled task to run a, D, a load of file. will run like, you know, a function to a DLL, and then it will drop a rootkit. And again, this is 100% reliable because uh, there's no like, memory corruption. You can't fail, right? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, and the interesting thing is this, this thing only works on Windows Vista and higher. And now, you got to remember at this time, uh, yeah, it works on Win Win Windows Vista and higher because on Windows XP and lower, the jobs uh, scheduled tasks are not stored in XML, they're stored in a different format. So anyways, uh, so that's, from the, uh, that's the task schedule vulnerability. The third one is keyboard layout. So this one is particularly interesting because this one, uh, like I worked on this one. Uh, so you got to remember that Arthur and I were working on, on this like, concurrently. We were trying to figure out how the hell like, are, we, are drivers being installed. So um, I used a different approach just because of experience, and Arthur used a different. So Arthur used process monitor and a debugger. So what I did was I used Windows XP and IDA. Okay? And of course, we observed different behavior. And you know, he was telling me on, on his computer, he saw, oh, dude, I saw like, the task schedule DL being loaded. I was like, dude, no, fucking way. I don't see that shit happening on mine. So I didn't believe him. Uh, but you know, I'm running on Windows, of course, you got to remember at this point, I did not know that uh, you know, on Windows XP, it triggers uh, a different bug. So I didn't believe him. I told him, I told him, dude, you're full of shit. It's not working. So um, uh, anyways, um, so what was, what was my approach? Uh, and he actually, Arthur is. Um, uh, Arthur's like really smart. He, he, he knew that, I mean, he's, he's not hallucinating, so he convinced me. He showed me the logs, and he's like, all right, dude, I believe you, but fuck, how come I don't see this shit on my computer? Uh, of course, at the time, I didn't even think that he was using Windows 7, and I'm using Windows 6. I didn't think about that. Uh, anyway, so what I did was, um, <laughs> yeah, it's like horrible. Uh, so what I did was I stacked, analyzed the binary, starting from like main, and I traced there from there on. Uh, and then after like a few hours, I figure like that we extract uh, there's an unpacked binary and there is some like encrypted uh, files in the, the resource. I extract that, and I, I start analyzing it uh, statically. So I looked in, the, in this file, and this file. Um, let's see. So when I analyze this, you gotta remember this is like a mega code, and I don't. I only have a few hours to look at this stuff, and. Um, in the beginning, what sucks in the beginning, what sucks and does it loads up this DLL hooking so they can load DLL in memory right in from disk. So there's like a lot of work. It's like I don't know. It's probably like over a thousand like lines of assembly to do this crap, and it's like really complicated, I guess. So uh, I saw I wasted mad time doing this. Of course, I didn't get anywhere, and I still couldn't figure out what the fuck. Why is my Windows XP being owned? Uh, so what? I, but so I looked at one of the like the, all the binaries I extracted from uh, the resource section, and one of them 
uh, had uh, like some uh, had strings that had winterk.sys and so on. Uh, and, it was, and I knew from the, 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 the dead listing, I knew they were searching for something inside winterk.sys. But the question? Oh, OK, sorry. Please, um, please save your questions till the end. So yeah, so the logic for this is like kind of complicated. It's like, you look at the fl control flow graph, it's like, I don't know, like probably hundreds of like uh, basic blocks, and it's like, crap. I, 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 I manually went through it, and I knew we were searching for something, but the, lo the overall picture didn't, was not very clear to me. So this one, you know, I was, I, this is sus uh, suspicious to me. Again, things to remember at this point. Management needed actionable information, so they need to make decisions, you know, what to do and so on. So they need, like, answers, like, very fast. Other com well, I'm constantly reminded, you know, other companies are working on this as well. I, mean, I think Symantec even had a blog at this time talking about this stuff. Of course, they haven't found this yet. Um, so, but another thing to remember is, in reality, binary ass is not like Pokemon training, right? It's, like, fucking hard sometimes. You don't know what the hell you're looking at, right? It takes time and patience. Uh, so, and people are constantly asking you for answers and blah, 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 blah. You know, you can't make up an answer and tell them because that's, like, bad news. So these, so it's like a lot of pressure. Um, thank God, our, my management is like pretty smart. They know that this stuff takes time, but they still want results. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I'm serious. I, sometimes, like some of these, uh, some managers, they think, oh, if you know how to use IDA, then therefore you're a reverse engineer. It's like, dude, like it doesn't work that way. And you try to explain to them, they don't understand. But yeah, thank God, yeah, all my managers are really smart. So, anyway, so at this point, I'm like hella stressed. So I took this home, and I knew that. I realized that going through the code line by line would be very time consuming and I wouldn't get the results in time. Somebody might beat me to it. Uh, so it's not a cut it. So what I did was I used all the facts that I knew from this binary. One, I knew that there was code I was searching for something inside win3k.sys. I knew that there is uh, code that allocates memory using anti virtual allocate memory. And then there's code that loads keyboard layouts. I have no idea what the fuck keyboard layouts are, but I just saw a code that was using it. And then Ida failed to disassemble some blob of code, some blob of bytes, I should say. Right? And that was it. Those are, these are all the only things I knew. And I, at this point, I had a hunch. I knew that I was getting really close, but I couldn't quite grasp what the hell was going on. At this point, I had a pretty high suspicion that the bug is in win3k.sys. But I didn't know where, because win3k.sys is massive. Right? It could be anywhere. Uh, so my suspicion is, like, OK, it's in win3k.sys. That's all I have. So this, you got to remember, it's like pretty late at night, uh, probably around this time, actually. So uh, after like, a lot of stack analysis, I got tired. And uh, so I thought, OK, how the hell do I come up with this, the result so that the following morning I have something to tell the team? So, a whole bunch of, so I went through a, a few thought process. Uh, I thought, OK, well, my first, the first thing that came to mind was, one, hook up a kernel debugger. And I, I tell the debugger to tell me, I tell the debugger to say, hey, dude, notify me when this, root, the, when this driver is installed. And from there on, once the driver is installed, the kernel breaks in, and I see, look at all the stack traces to see if there's anything that's like, suspicious. But again, of course, that doesn't work. It's one work because driving Windows, drivers are loaded in, like, by this uh, system con uh, process context. And like, you won't get much information out of that. So, that won't, so the, this first uh, like, thought process, I mean, this first thought failed. So it was, next one I thought was, OK, well, that didn't work. So let me uh, use uh, another technique. So I said, OK, this must be a kernel, a kernel exploit. Therefore, and exploits tend to crash them from time to time. So because rarely you get 100% reliability, right? So I said, OK, well, the exploit is going to crash one point or another. And if it crashes, I get a blue screen. I get a blue screen, I get a crash dump. From a crash dump, I can like, figure out what's going on. So this is the process that's going in my head. Uh, this made perfect sense to me, but I ran the fucking exploit like 10 times. And it didn't crash at all. And I still get on every single time. It's like, what the fuck, dude? Uh, so, and I thought this is like another logic bug. It's like something I'm missing here, right? So uh, it's like, kind of like discouraging. Uh, so the next one I thought was, OK, well, uh, kernel exploits usually have put shellcode in user land memory and then try to execute it there. Uh, so um, what I, why don't I ask the debugger, hey, man, uh, when, the debu when the kernel tries to execute some code in user mode, can you like, let me know? Of course, this is wishful thinking, because we don't have this, mm, this, this function that does not exist. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, so I got like, really like, depressed about this. It's like, holy shit, dude, I, I need to have something the following day, blah, 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 blah. So I got tired and went and looked at some porn. And uh, so anyways, uh, I'm just kidding. No. So I thought, OK, like I'm like really tired by this point, right? I'm like, fuck, dude. Like, this is like, stressful. And so, uh, so all of the previous experiments failed. So I was like, what the fuck? What am I missing here? I need to rethink this again. 
So, okay, so I thought, okay, which, uh, I have many pieces of the puzzle, but I'm like, uh, I need to figure out, like, am I missing any other, like, crucial pieces? And I thought, okay, well, the only other piece I don't understand is, like, these blob of bytes that are not, that, are, that has no references to it in IDA, and IDA can't fucking figure out what it is. And I looked at this and was like, hmm, okay, I need me to look into this. So I decided to look at this blob of code. And I saw this. This is the blob of code that's like, repeated a whole bunch of times, right? So how many of you, like, rec this is, like, stand out to any of you guys? Yeah, so this is like, uh, so I was like, oh man, this code looks very, very familiar. Uh, so you, know, you recognize the E8 followed by a whole bunch of zeros, and you know, of course I reckon the C3. So I was like, ah, oh, okay, all right, well, uh, thought process again. These bytes are stored, uh, I stood out to me because of uh, three reasons. One, Ida didn't properly analyze them. Two, they had no obvious cross-references to them. And three, they had reminded me of shellcode, right, just from the byte pattern. Uh, so I had other thought experiments. I said, okay, well, if these bytes are shellcode, then they have to be executed somehow at one point or another, right? And um, since they'll be executed, if I patch it with OXCC and I hook up a current debugger to it, and the exploit is successful, my current debugger should break in because CC is an int3, right? So this is how I went about it, and I, this is how I thought how this process. I didn't know it was going to work or not, uh, so I went out and tried. It doesn't hurt, right? So this, you know, the, the, the byte pattern I just show you is, is that, like, it's like push, call plus five, pop. This is pretty standard shellcode, right? But at the end, you see like exchange, ex, and esp, and all right. It's kind of like ROP style, but I'm like, what the fuck, dude, ROP? And most, usually people don't use ROP stuff in kernel when they use like in user mode. This is like, kind of weird. Um, but anyway, so um, remind me to talk about the shellcode later, because it's actually pretty interesting. Like, the attacker may generate this code using uh, some type of code transformation tool. So uh, remind me to talk about it later. But anyway, so when I did it, yep, it looks like real code to me. So I patched one of it to CC, and sure enough, uh, it led me in the right direction. I patched a whole bunch of the bytes to CC, hooked up the current debugger, ran it, boom. Uh, the, the current debugger broke in, and I got a nice stack trace. And from there on, I literally sent the email. When I, when I got the stack trace, holy crap, man, this is a breakthrough. I knew this is, I was getting close. So I sent the stack trace to the, to the team at like fucking like 1 AM, and I went to sleep. Um, Next morning, we came in, and you know, with the stack, we were able to figure out what the bug was. So the bug is this. Uh, Windows allows users to load different keyboard layouts. Like, for example, if you're in China or whatever, you know, in the US, the keyboard layouts are different. You can load them. Uh, keyboard layouts are loaded uh, to on Windows Vista and higher. Uh, keyboard layouts are loaded from the system directory only. So you can't, you know, like, no, only admins can write there. But on Windows XP, it can be loaded from anywhere. That restriction is not there. So in kernel mode, what happens is that in the, inside the function that, um, that loads a keyboard layout file, there's an integer that's read from the layout file. And this integer is used to index into an array of function pointers. Uh, yeah, and then the index is not probably validated, so basically the attacker can control this, uh, they can basically get the kernel call anywhere they want. Right? But what the fuck, you know, you can control the call what you want, but you need to know, like, you, the, you, you need to uh, have memory allocated at the destination that you're going to call at first, right? So what the attackers did was, it's actually really smart. So the ANLSVK proc, that's actually the, the array of function pointers, right? And you see there, there are three function pointers there, like the top three, WinDRUK, KBDNS, blah, blah, blah. But you see immediately a few bytes, uh, a few bytes after that, you see the 60, 63, 62, 61, and 0060. So um, in Windows, <coughs> the, the, uh, the, the like, like OX7, FFFF, and below is from in user mode. Anything higher than that is kernel mode. Uh, so what the attackers did was they searched for, uh, once they find the, the base address of this uh, uh, function, the, the um, array of function pointers, they start scanning down from there and to figure out where the, uh, like the next D word that is within the user mode range. So they found like 60, 63, 60, 61. Then they call, they allocate memory at that exact address, and then they put code there. And then they change index so that so the X will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The index will be 5, the kernel will call that function directly. And that's it. Um, now, one thing is that at this point, I should have like realized that like since I've, an I've analyzed like a whole bunch of these win 3 k sys exploits, and, and you know every single time people need to map the null page, so they use you know anti virtual allocate. I should have like spotted that immediately. I should have like set a breakpoint there, and you see what's being written there. But at the time, you know, I guess when you're like under a lot of stress, you don't think through all the different options right away. Uh, but thank God, like the, the previous OXCC trick works. So, but anyways, uh, so that's how this the exploit works. So the attack, from the attacker's perspective is, uh, they were, so the, the task schedule is only used if you're on Vista and higher. This vuln is only used if you're on, window, on Windows XP or below, okay? Um, and 
the expo exploring the keyboard layout issue is actually pretty easy, right? I mean, I told you once, the, once you know what the details of the volume is, I mean, it's like, it's like you know, little kids can do this. My mom can do this. Um, so uh, it's actually very easy. And then another thing is the attackers, the people who wrote this, they, like the, their target environment must be somewhat diverse. It must have like, you know, like, like XP and X, uh, Vin Windows Vista and higher. So they, they probably want to target everybody. So anyway, that's what I got out of it. All right, so <clears throat> of course, you know, once we figured that part, I was like, oh man, this is like great. I, f I found this. Um, so I felt pretty good. So we found three volumes so far. And like, crap, like how can there be more? Uh, the ironic thing is like the guy who sits across from me, he told me, oh man, Bruce, keep on looking. There could be more in there. I told him, oh dude, like quit joking around. <laughs> Anyways, uh, one day, uh, Kaspersky sends us an email. It's like, hey dude, uh, we saw some traffic. Uh, that's some weird, or, like RPC traffic. Um, like, do you guys see this? Uh, can you take a look into it? It's like, uh, no, because I don't run malware on the network and stuff. Because I mean, I usually, I mean, I run a VM, right, but I don't usually care about like network connectivity. I don't usually care about that stuff. Um, and so I didn't. So I said, no, I don't know about this. So we said, okay, well, let me take a look at this. So what I did was, I just set up two VMs and then had them connect to each other, and I ran Stuxnet on one of them, and I went to lunch. Uh, and then uh, I came back and I discovered, fuck, dude, the other machine got infected. It's like, what the fuck? How is it going? This is weird. <laughs> right? It's like one after another. Uh, so, anyway, so, so this one is like, uh, so this one at least, you know, there's no stack trace or whatever, but I have uh, packet trace. So when the packet trace, I was able to figure out what was going on. Uh, so we, we, I saw that it was enumerating printer shares. As a connecting to the printer share using a guest account, and then it's sending like print, uh, write data to file or some crap like that. Uh, and it sends like an exe over and a moth file. So I, I looked at the, uh, the RPC routines that was used, and I was like, hmm, yep, this is in the spooler code, and the spooler is creating a file. But it is, you know, knowing this doesn't actually help at all because this didn't make, didn't make any fucking sense. Typically, the spooler needs to impersonate the user who's connected to it before it does some, it performs an operation, right? Because it doesn't make, make sense for you to, like, you know, spooler, you don't remember, spooler runs as, like, a uh, system. So it's, like, highest privilege. So, and I said, like, yeah, I've worked on spooler case before, and, like, this is not, this logic does not make sense to me. How the hell is this happening? Uh, this, uh, the file creation should have failed because uh, guest accounts don't have privilege to create files in system 32. Uh, so what we did, we this, so we added the, uh, the printer team. Once we found out this is real to printer, we added the printer team. We figured this out, <laughs> and it turns out that uh, there's, there's, there's two special cases. <laughs> the two special cases, one is that um, if you're a guest, uh, if, you're a guest, if it's a guest account and you're connecting to the network draw, uh, printer, then the system will impersonate itself, which is like system, and it will do the stuff for you. Or if the share printer is one of some like, you know, list of like 15 printers or something like that. And I'm like, what the fuck? So there's uh, this comment on top that says, oh yeah, we have to do this because uh, on Windows XP, the guest account doesn't have privilege to do X, Y, Z, and therefore we have to use system to do it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so we of course, you know, once we figured this out, it took like five minutes. Um, so the guy, the, the guy, the guy from the printer team, the guy literally had a fix within five minutes. Like, dude, Bruce, wait, on, wait for the. I'm writing the fix right now, and I'm building the package. Like really fast. Uh, so anyways, but of course the fix was his fix. His initial fix only fixed one part. It wasn't a complete fix. Later on, we, had, we involved more people and we found out that we had to fix other places. But yeah, so that's how we found the spool issue, uh, thanks to Kaspersky. So the root cause is that, yeah, I just explained to you, uh, spooler, basically, allow, uh, you can share a printer if you, have, if you allow a guest account. Guest accounts can connect to it, and then, uh, it, uh, to, and then tell the spool, once it's connected, tell the spooler, hey, print this data to a file for me, and you specify the path, and then you send the, the, the file. And that's pretty much it. Now, but one, well, the cool thing is that this phone only allows you to write a file anywhere you want. It doesn't allow you to execute the file. So that's where the moth file comes in. This is like pretty creative because I mean I didn't know about this. The moth file is actually like kind of like compiled script almost, and they wrote the moth file in system32 slash like wbam slash moth. And I'm like, what the fuck is special about why this directory? It turns out Windows has a thread that continues watching this particular directory for new files being dropped in there. Once a new file is being dropped, in, it picks it up and it runs it. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, uh, so, yeah, uh, now you can remember, right, so, so people, be, so people were thinking, okay, well, like, is that like a vuln? Like, no, it's not a vuln because, like, you need admin access to write files to this place anyways, and it's actually, it's not an EX that you run, it's like a, some compile stuff, but anyways, so what they did was they wrote a script to run, that run the EXE file they just wrote, 
Uh, and that's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the details how we fix uh, the principle work. It's like, really complicated. But anyways, uh, from the, the attacker perspective, so this phone only exists if the printer server was allowing anonymous connections. So the target, the target uh, network that they were going after must have had uh, servers with this configuration. That's why, I mean, otherwise there's no point, right? Um, and this is the way Stuxnet spreads on the network. Once it's on the computer, it scans, enumerates all the shares around it, and then if it is connected, it uses exploit. Uh, so the attackers must have wanted like large-scale infections. You know, I'm not sure why they want to do this, but that's what I think that's... That's at least my hypothesis of it. And the attack had good tricks, too. Uh, like for example, I didn't know about this moth trick, um, but they did. So, um, The lessons I learned from this is uh, doing like a thorough job is like really hard. It requires a lot of time. And in real life, when you're being asked questions like, you know, every few hours, it's pretty stressful. And like, you don't have time to go you know, line by line and explain it, right? Especially if it's black box and you don't know, it's, you don't know what you're going to find. You don't know what you're looking at. Um, so, so you got to find a balance between there. Uh, and then, like, so in my case, I learned the mistake from that was, like, I took the, uh, the old school approach, which is literally starting from main and tracing down. That's, like, bad news. Don't do that. Only do that when you have time. But, uh, yeah. And the other one is, like, the ability to figure out important facts and then putting them together to see a bigger picture is really important. Like, for example, in the Winthrop case, case, like, I figured all this stuff out, but I couldn't, couldn't quite figure out how they all fit together until, like, towards the end. So if you figure them out early, you can at least get some clues, and it's easier for you to debug. And the other one is like work with other people. For example, Arthur, um, he doesn't like reverse engineer stuff, but he has good ideas, right? So I should have used, you know, listened to him when I should not have doubted him when I should not have told him the process monitor was useless for reverse engineering. Uh, so that was like bad of me. But anyway, yeah, work with other people, and also like one person, you know, you you're not gonna know everything, you know, like you don't know how Spooler works in and out. You have to talk to the guys who who, wrote, who work on this every day. So they can explain stuff to you. Like you might be doing one aspect of it, but there may be other aspects that you don't understand that may affect the end result. Yeah. So. Uh, and the other one. Okay. Uh, about the attackers. Uh, so okay. That's, what that, that's all the volumes. After that, um, I spent time uh, decompiling the rootkit, and Rolf uh, did the uh, DL loading part. And like you know, we spent a lot of time analyzing. The, since now we're pretty confident that we found all the volumes. I mean, literally, Manchin came and asked me, "Bruce, are you 100% sure that there's nothing else in here?" And I said, "Yes, I am sure." And that was, thank God, I was right. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> um, so so anyways, uh, so after that, we had some free time, so I decided to take a look at this a little bit more. And based on like the, the way the code is written, I could tell that the malware components were written by different people. Like, for example, the exploit were written by different people, and the, the rootkits were written by... The rootkits, basically, what it does, one is to hide files. The other one is to inject code into like, user land. That's a, the SCADA, pro SCADA infection uh, stuff. Um, so they were written by different people. Uh, and, and, like, the driver was built from probably, like, a removable uh, media. Because, like, when you create uh, Windows drivers, uh, and, you, and you build it with the Windows uh, driver development kit, the build environment, it'll embed, they automatically embed the full path to your uh, project in there. So it, it, I think the path they had was like B colon whack, guava, something like that. So B drive is usually like removable, like probably like a floppy disk or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, um, the attackers were definitely aiming for 100% reliability and high impact. All the, all the exploits I just explained to you like, will run like 100%, with 100% reliability. Like, there's no crashing. Um, so <clears throat> even the kernel exploits, right? Um, so yeah, they were like they really wanted reliability. Apparently, they didn't want the computer to crash or they didn't want people to notice. Um, uh, decompilation. I don't know if I have enough time to talk about this. I didn't actually prepare the slides because it's like, really involved. Uh, there are different tricks when we. Uh, so I. Okay. Wait. What does that mean? I have enough time? Not enough time? Okay. Well, I mean, it's not gonna be much. I'm not gonna talk. About it. I didn't. Um, so. I didn't put the details here because the, the topic so is probably going to be like, I, I, once I wrote the, the slides, I realized that this, the whole process of decompiling this back to C code will probably require another talk, so which will probably, Rolf and I will probably do at, a, at a one point or another. Uh, so there are the different tricks when you decompile. So most of you, you don't, most of the time, like, you don't need to decompile stuff, right? Uh, you only need to do that if it's like, you know, if you want to feel good or uh, you want to test your skills. Um, so, what I, I mean, before I've decompiled code before, but just, just like one function, like one or two functions at all. But I've never done like full program decompilation before. <clears throat> and this one seems like it's, the target was, was good enough for me to decompile, so I went ahead and did it. And there's a Windows driver, 
and like, the different tricks you have to use. Like for example, like the comp there are a lot of compile optimization that you have to be aware of and figure out okay, to see to go from the disassembly code back to the uh, like the source code, blah blah blah. So maybe we'll talk about it another day. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyways, uh, there are like a lot of people who worked on this, um, and they have to be thanked because it's like a lot of effort. Uh, Peter Ferry, uh, who got you know uh, who uh, who helped who helped me reverse engineer a lot of this stuff, and he also found some of the SCADA stuff, but he's not here. Arthur, the guy who found the task scheduler, Mark Wo, who helped me work with the spool issue, our engineering team, Ken Johnson, who found, who was the one, so I was gone for a few days, so they assigned uh, Ken Johnson to analyze the remaining uh, binaries that we extracted, and he found the, the, uh, the net API vulnerability. So there's actually five vulns, four of them are zero day, the fifth one is MSO 067, that one is also used to spread around the network. Uh, and then the Spooler team, uh, Richard Van Eden, who worked on the task scheduler, and then Rolf Rolls, who, he doesn't work for us, but uh, we decompile stuff together for fun. And then the Kaspersky team in, uh, in, uh, in Moscow. Uh, Kaspersky is actually the only um, team, uh, because they sent us the task, the uh, Prince Spooler stuff, we actually share all the details with them, like, all the, all the volumes. We had a con call with them, and we share pretty much everything we knew about the malware. And they did the same. And then we had an agreement that said, yeah, we're not going like, to share this with other people. Uh, so they should be thanked for that. And like, the guys in the, like, the Moscow office are like, really elite, so uh, yeah. Um, and then, like, of course, I want to thank the uh, virus block AD and Bellers for sending us the PDF, and the AV test guys for sending us the, um, the sample for analysis. Um, and questions? Questions. So if anyone... <laughs> So the way we're going to do questions, if, um, if you've got a question, if you can line up um, behind the two microphones here, and what we're going to do is for every, after two questions from the audience here, um, we're going to take a question from the hackers' bases. Hang on a minute. Oh yeah, one thing, like don't ask me about who did this, the attribution, like wait for a WikiLeaks or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, so they have no questions? Uh, okay, fine. Okay, so um, questions. Uh, we'll start with this gentleman here. Um, speak into the microphone and make sure it's on. Um, Chef will take care of it. Uh, earlier you explained that um, when you gain uh, the privileges the system privileges. Uh huh. Um, the system privileges are like root. So yes. Do you use Linux? <laughs> Tav is where are you at? Yes, I use Linux from time to time. <laughs> okay, this gentleman here. Do you know or can you guess how long Stuxnet was around before you discovered it? Pardon? Uh, do you know or can you guess how long Stuxnet was around and was used before you discovered it? Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, so some of the AV, uh, there are certain various companies that said that this has been around for over a year, I guess. So yeah, there are different versions of it, I guess. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Next. Um. First of all, I never expected to enjoy Microsoft's talk this much. <laughs> Windows runs StarCraft and that's all I needed to do. Um, um, I'm a lot more familiar with uh, the SPS systems and AWL, so I'm interested did you uh, find anything about these systems, or did other people who have actually running the WinCC <coughs> software find out about it first? So you're talking about like the SCADA stuff, right? Uh, Look. About this, I'm talking about the Siemens. Yeah, yeah, the Siemens stuff. Um, stuff. Yeah, so once we, we figured, so we, we had a lot, pretty much the majority of the malware understood with the exception of the, the Siemens part, because it has its own like op code and crap like that. It's not you know, like, very obvious, like, oh, hook function A and do you know, blah. It's not very obvious. Yeah, and like, I don't know anything about SCADA systems. So what happened was uh, 
Uh, yeah, I did not look. I did not look at that. Uh, but do talk. To, uh, talk to me after the, the uh, after this is over, and uh, we can explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not very comfortable asking, uh, answering those type of questions. So, yeah. Um, regarding one uh, of the vulner vulnerabilities, uh, you mentioned that it was known to some other guys at Microsoft for quite some time. Did I understand you right? No, uh, it was known. To, actually, there are two vaults that were known to the uh, were known to the public for quite a while. One is the Prince Buller one that was known in like I don't know something like some magazine uh, that was like in 2008 or something like that. But then the the link vulnerability that one was known to various people, uh, so not at Microsoft, not that I'm aware of, but external people knew about it for several years. Yes. Ah, so Microsoft just wasn't aware of it. It was was it a zero day or didn't my, Microsoft knew of it and didn't patch it or what am I missing here? No, I mean so. The people who knew about this vuln did not use it in a large scale at all. They used it like once or twice. So like nobody knew about it. Only when this thing came up, people were like, oh yeah, dude, I knew about this in like, you know, like two or three years ago. I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you may have already said this. How long did this take beginning to end from... Uh, ah, from beginning think? to end, in terms of man hours, we had two guys and Arthur, I'm guessing, I don't know, like... 40, 30, 40 hours maybe at most. Yeah. So, yeah. Wait. Uh, yeah. The, the, the decompilation took a little bit. Uh, took a bit longer. Uh, well, like, yeah. Because we were like, uh, like perfectionists. We want to, the op codes to match like, completely. So we, we like had to tweak around a little bit. But uh, yeah. Those, those 40 hours, 40 man hours were over. A couple of days or one one day. Or? So it's over. A period, yeah. So I'm trying to think. Uh, it's over like maybe three, four days probably. Yeah. Thanks. So like, uh, you don't remember like once we knew something, we share it to like to the we send this and we have a mailing list that we have people who are involved in this. And once you know like the root cause is understood, like people just uh, you know did a fixed proposal. I mean it was within minutes. So. You wanted to talk more about the shellcode. Ah, uh, yeah. So the shellcode. The shellcode was basically uh, to um, so the shellcode was to load some other files in. And to be in shellcode, like so, the pattern that I showed the exchange EIX, ESP, and like a ret, that pattern is constant. There's no calls in the shellcode. Everything is done in terms of exchange EX, uh, ESP, ret. Um, and I think one of the main reasons why. Uh, the code was written this way. I, th I don't think it was written on purpose. I think what they, had, they had a tool to do a, uh, the, that transformed the original code into this form. So it will be d more difficult to, I guess, identify to uh, how do I say to identify like the, if they want to reuse this again, it will be hard for you to figure. Oh yeah, like uh, it was these people who did it. You know what I mean? Um, so like, so to probably have to increase like reusability. Um, that's, oh. what, that's what I guessed. And we have a question from the audience, yep. oh, from, from, from the hackerspaces. Yes, exactly. And uh, this is an interesting question from Joe, who joined us. And his question is, were there just a zero-day exploit? Or because he had read some rumors in the media that there were about four zero-days in Stuxnet. Sorry, I'm like, something about four so, zero yeah, days. So were all the vulns that in Stuxnet zero days? There are five there of, them, that there were five of them. So there were a total of five ex uh, vulnerabilities. Four of them were zero days. So four out of five. Yeah. The other one was fixed in like 2008 or something. I'm sorry, 67. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, some five years ago, Microsoft has published the uh, Strider Ghostbuster Rootkit Finder. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I remember, that concept seems reasonable to me. Did you consider using it to go deeper into that rootkit issue and to make it kind of more um, more an external uh, internal view uh, comparison? So, uh, as, as, as far as I see, you you have uh, more or less um, judged whether there is something or not by evidence and not by a, by a real um, uh, total view on on how it looks external and how it looks internal the system. 
Uh, I'm not understanding this question. So you're talking about a stride. Well, uh, and, and the nature of a rootkit is uh, that, that it um, hides by, by yep, yep. modifying the system up. Is that means yep, yep. you don't see it. Well, with an external view, ah, okay, you, you see, can yeah. see it. That's yes. a concept yeah, yeah, yeah. of that okay. strider system. Yep. At that time, uh, Bruce Schneier has uh, commented very positive about it, and I think maybe that would have been an option to make sh sure that there is nothing else, nothing yeah. more so than you have found. So basically, the first thing we did was, I mean, like, they submitted, uh, when this file came in, we automated submit to an automated analysis system, in which basically spit out all the different uh, file re the results, that, like, you know, let's say, what the rootkit does, and, like, say, attaches to a certain file, to a certain, um, attaches to, like, the CDFS driver, blah, 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 blah. You know, it, it, it told us all these things, right? But that was not, that's not actually very important to, to me, at least, because that doesn't actually help me figure out how the hell did the rootkit get installed. Do you know what I mean? Like, the behavior of the rootkit, is not as important to me because I need to know how my objective was to figure out how the rootkit was installed. So, uh, from a vulnerability perspective, and after we figured that out, then we analyzed the rootkit manually. At least I did. So, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But yeah, sorry. Well, uh, kind kind of. At least um, I I think uh, this could be a kind of a uh, last step to make sure that there is nothing else. Ah, I see. I see, I see what you're saying. So, so you think that using this tool to to, to ensure that there are no other volumes or like, yeah, 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 I see, I see what you're saying. So we were, we were pretty, the reason why I was pretty calm there were nothing else is because like we, uh, I spent a lot of time like going over the code and like we had confirmations, uh, I shouldn't say confirmation, like my other partner agreed with me and so on. So that's how we were able to figure out, yeah. Right, we have time for, well, we're going to take these last two and then we're going to have to call it. So uh, this gentleman here. You said that it was one megabyte of code in total that you analyzed? Can you step forward and speak into the microphone? I try again, but I don't know if it's on. Yeah, okay. So yeah. you said it's one megabyte of uh, total yeah, data? Yes, about a meg, yeah. About a, about a megabyte. How much of this was the SCADA payload, and how much about was the actual Stuxnet? Uh, don't quote me on this, but uh, I don't know how big this uh, is. I didn't look at the SCADA part, uh, all the exploits, and the DL loading part, which is duplicated in two files. I don't know, I mean, I'll take a wild guess. Like, probably like... I probably shouldn't even take a wild guess. Uh, yeah. Scientific guess. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the exports were uh, everything, like at least the x86 code, I'm guessing probably be like 300, uh, 300K, 400K, or something like that, I'm guessing. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't make a good uh, uh, answer on that. Yeah. Is the automated analysis tool you just mentioned an in-house tool of Microsoft, or is it something that's publicly available? So like, practically every like AV vendor has these. I mean, it's like you know, like a Norman Sandbox or CW Sandbox and so on. They just tell you, you know, hey, these files are written. Hey, look, you know, like this, uh, this DL is injected into this process. Blah blah blah. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's an internal tool. But I mean, the service is free. I think you can just upload stuff to. Uh, there are free sandboxes that you can upload stuff to, and get the same result. Uh, we only use that because um, I didn't want to waste my time looking at stuff that has uh, that the, the the emulation layer. Sorry, I didn't want to I didn't want to waste time understand looking at stuff that were already understood by uh, the automated tool. Yeah. So, okay, very good. Okay, great. Um, so, if anyone has uh, any other uh, questions for Bruce, um, you can crowd outside and you can all you know. Um, you know, take turns frisking each other to make sure nobody's going to try and stab, shoot, or uh, yeah. poison poor old Bruce here. Yeah. You know, yeah. remember to look out for uh, uh, the vaguely shifty looking guy, especially the one who wanted to talk to you earlier. You know, yeah. and uh, yeah, I hope the other guys that you mentioned on your thank you list as well remember to look underneath the car before <laughs> they go in the morning, all right? Yeah. So uh, that, that was uh, Bruce. Big hand, please, for Bruce.